It was the week of September 30th, 1999. Me and my old man were about to board the train home from Manchester Piccadilly train station. As with large swathes of the city centre, Piccadilly, one of the largest and busiest stations in the country, was undergoing a refurb in the wake of the terrorist bombing of 1996 and leading up to the Commonwealth Games in 2002. To the tune of £100 million, the majestic but absolutely filthy Victorian roof was being replaced, and the smelly old brutalist smoke hole was morphing into the anonymous, globalised, white and shiny glass and steel sea that exists in the city centre today. Me and my dad mooched into WH Smith's, and because it was the 90s we bought a Caramac and a bottle of Fruitopia, and as we did so, a magazine caught my eye. The official Sega Dreamcast magazine issue zero. Much like the POMO architecture emerging before my very eyes, it was white, it was shiny, it was minimal and self-consciously futuristic. The grungy, trancy sci-fi trappings of the Saturn and PS1 generation were no more. Here was the start of a new era. In true 90s fashion, it even came with a VHS tape stuck to the front cover. On September the 23rd, Sega bring you the key to the future of interactive multiplayer gaming. Get a life and get a Dreamcast. Dreamcast is the most powerful games console in the world's history, by far. And it's the first games console that will bring you into the world of online gaming, emailing and worldwide web surfing. Dreamcast will take you beyond your expectations. Its unrivaled 128-bit technology leaps ahead of current systems in terms of graphics, speed, and pure, unadulterated gameplay. Dreamcast's awesome speed can deliver over 4 million polygons a second, making it look better and play better than anything your TV has ever seen. Fluid animation, lighting effects, 3D environments, and textures appear more lifelike than ever thought possible. In-game audio reaches new heights with a staggering 64 channels of music, voices, and sound effects. With technology like this, Dreamcast will redefine the way you play. Gamers who were a decent age back in the late 90s will know how amazing Dreamcast games looked compared to the competition at launch. It was quite a leap from the PS1 and N64, of course, but it even compared favourably to the most powerful PCs of that time. The developer of MDK2 compared its performance to that of a Pentium 3 500 machine with a Reva TNT2 graphics card. The Dreamcast's PowerVR graphics hardware was awesome for the time. A PC like this would have cost an absolute fortune, yet the Dreamcast did it for £200. I remember seeing a Dreamcast kiosk in HMV in Liverpool city centre with my brother back in 99 and playing the absolutely amazing looking ready to rumble boxing. The boxes themselves were incredibly detailed and their facial features were massively beyond anything on the other consoles available at that time. It was dinky, it was cute and yet it was extremely powerful for its day. It was awesome and it was exciting. I would argue that the Dreamcast was in many ways the first modern console, in the sense that many of its features are still with us today. It was a PC-friendly Windows CE powered system, along with a modem and internet access. Along with the iMac released in 1998, it seemed to herald a new era of consumer electronics. In fact, I would argue that the design of a great deal of today's consumer tech, at least in terms of their aesthetics, is largely a refinement of the stuff that was being released around this time. Soon, everything would be white, or black, shiny and minimal. Anyway, this is probably a bit contentious, but I'd also say that the Dreamcast was the first console that could really do 3D graphics properly. Many would say the PlayStation did it first, others might say it was the N64, but when you saw the Dreamcast outputting something like Sonic Adventure of 480p resolution in RGB at a high frame rate, the other console games looked very crude indeed. The majority of N64 games moved at an absolute snail's pace in comparison, its low poly models and very simplistic textures, along with its visual filter, gave a distinctly murky presentation. 
The PlayStation and Saturn's non-perspective correct textures, low resolutions and low frame rates were... well, they were blown away. And as for something like Shenmue, this realistic, rich, textured and absolutely enormous virtual world was far beyond the last generation consoles. Anyway, enough preamble. The Dreamcast has a special place in my heart, and because I'm an idiot and I can't think of a better idea for a video at the moment, I'm gonna look at every official Dreamcast game ever released, and I'm gonna do it in release order. This, I think, is a lot more interesting and less abstract than the usual alphabetical order. If we do it by release, we can go on a journey, from the Japanese launch right through to 2D Shooter Karo, or Crow, released in the space year 2007, and it'll also give me a chance to waffle on about the video game landscape at that time, to put this brave little console in a bit of context, and hopefully create a sort of map of this white, shiny 480p continent. If I get this series finished before I die, I'll be very surprised, but hey, aim for the moon and all that, eh? So, strap yourselves in and join me on a sacred quest into the magical world of... We like to call nap happy, but when he wakes up, watch out! Sneak! What a clown! He baffles everybody with his wacky style. Jaw! Unstoppable and delicious! I played an hour or so of this with my four-year-old daughter recently, and you know what? We had a pretty damn good time, actually. It's a racing game. The twist is that you're either running, swimming, or kind of, uh, sledging. There's a variety of colorful courses in the typical kids' game fashion. Jungle, ice, lava, etc, etc. The art design is kind of ugly, to be honest with you, but it certainly is bright, colorful, and memorable. <laughs> This is a sugar rush of a video game, hence why my daughter, herself powered by large quantities of sugar most of the time, enjoys it so much. It didn't get very good reviews at the time, but it's still good crack today, in my opinion, especially if you have a wee nipper to enjoy it with.
Fight one. Ready, go! <laughs> Okay, one of the big guns now, of course. We'll go back to the Saturn era for a minute to start this discussion, if you'll permit me. Virtua Fighter 3 stunned everybody at the arcades back in 1996 with its absolutely ludicrous 3D visuals. I remember seeing screenshots of this tech demo in the official Saturn magazine back in those days and just being astonished by how realistic it looked. Pretty much like a high-end pre-rendered image of that time. Everybody wanted a home port of this game, of course, but everyone pretty much accepted that the Saturn just would not be capable of doing it. It was one of those fabled impossible ports back in the late 90s. Having said that, there was apparently a port in development for the Saturn, but it was abandoned, and we got Fighters Megamix as a sort of apology to us loyal Sega Saturn fans. Featuring a huge number of characters, some movesets from Virtua Fighter 3, and some dumb but very fun game mechanics. The game was a pretty good time, but it was no Virtua Fighter 3. A bit like Sonic Adventure as the Dreamcast approached, Sega announced that Virtua Fighter 3 would be there at launch. A big theme for Sega at this time was, a bit like Sam Beckett from Quantum Leap, putting right what once went wrong. The Dreamcast was going to deliver everything, and a lot of us, myself included, were very excited by that prospect. Anyway, contrary to popular belief, Virtua Fighter 3 Tuberculosis, sorry, Virtua Fighter 3 TB, is a very good port of the arcade original. People played up its graphical inferiority to the Model 3 original, but as an owner of the original arcade board, I can demonstrate here just how close the two actually are. Fight, Fight one, one. Ready, ready, go! go! It's not entirely fair comparison because the Dreamcast is actually based on a different version of Virtua Fighter 3 than the arcade original you can see here. There are numerous differences, including the times of day and the stage here most notably, but nevertheless I think it will give us a good idea of the relative merits of the graphics in these two versions. And I think it's important to keep in mind that the Dreamcast is rendering this at 480p as opposed to the arcade's 384 medium resolution. That might not sound like much of an increase, but 384p as a proportion of 480p is... I have no fucking idea, someone else can work it out. But it's a significant difference in terms of processing power. 
Instead, the biggest issue here for me was just the sheer bare bonedness. I know that's not a word, but I'm gonna say it anyway, of this port. You can play the arcade mode, and that's pretty much it, in effect. And can anyone explain why they didn't just put this ending FMV at the beginning of the game? I mean, it really gets me in the mood to play it. One, ready, go! Virtual Fighter 3 was a massive release in Japan, but by the time it was released in the West, Soul Calibur in particular made it look pretty ordinary, really, in the graphics department at least, and the title had just lost some of its luster overall for one reason or another. It just wasn't the big draw that it would have been perhaps even a year earlier. Despite that, this is obviously an excellent game and a very good arcade port, and sold in absolutely enormous numbers back in Japan. July. I don't read or speak Japanese whatsoever, and there's no translation patch out there for this game, so I don't have a cat in hell's chance of getting anywhere with this one, unfortunately, but I put it on regardless.
a bit of a shame, really, because the art style's cool and distinctive, if a little bit ugly, in my opinion, and the music's pretty sweet, too. If any of you know more about this game, please let me know in the comments below. Godzilla Generations. I remember seeing screenshots of this game and being really impressed, but I've never actually played it until now. It strikes me as a quite fun, absorbing, but somewhat limited game. The physics of the falling buildings is crude by today's standards, of course, but there's no way the older consoles could have pushed this many polygons and effects while maintaining such a stable frame rate. Godzilla is massive in Japan, no pun intended. It doesn't have as much appeal in the West, of course, and this game wasn't actually released over here at all. Thinking about it, this game came out the same year as the Godzilla movie featuring Ferris Bueller and Leon, so I guess this game was kind of riding its coattails a little bit, although thankfully it's based on the classic original Godzilla movies rather than the underwhelming Roland Emmerich blockbuster. Anyway, I did have a bit of a chuckle with this one, but I think the spectacle and novelty of it would have been much greater way back in 1998, and there's relatively little left to enjoy today. Incoming. I used to see this everywhere during the UK launch window. It was always one of those games being demoed on the ceiling mounted CRTs of game shops like uh, Game or Electronics Boutique. It was very impressive graphically at the time and it was filled with prototypically 90s pumping tunes. Dreamcast could handle and at times actually exceed the performance of a high-end PC at that time, and this was mighty impressive indeed. 
This game had been used as a benchmark of sorts for PC hardware to see how many frames per second your new graphics card or Pentium CPU could spit out of your great big beige tower. To see this magic little £200 white box outperforming your £1,000 PC was a bit of a bummer for many PC owners at that time. That window didn't last too long, of course, but it was sweet while it did. If you were a Dreamcast owner, of course. Incoming alien fighters! What about the game itself? Well, it's pretty fun. Blow shit up with a big turret, blow shit up with some vehicles. The graphics are nice, the tunes are good, it feels good in the hand. It is a solid arcade action game. Incoming is a good example of what many titles on the Dreamcast are, really. A single, relatively simple idea refined to a diamond tip with nice production values and cool art design. You just can't argue with that formula. Unlike many of today's titles, these games don't try and be all things to all people. They know exactly what they are, and they are very good at doing it. We will see many games with this very same ethos on Sega's Dreamcast as we continue on our quest. Seventh Cross. I couldn't make fucking head nor tail of this one, sorry, and I found what I did play to be boring and kind of ugly. I don't want to dismiss this game unfairly though, so if you have some love for Seventh Cross Evolution, please let me know in the comments. Meanwhile, I'm going to refer to the Wikipedia entry to tell you what it's all about. The theme of Seventh Cross is evolution. The player begins with a protist, and through eating and consuming, progresses through two other stages until it becomes an animal. The game begins in a lagoon, where the player's organism must avoid predators while nourishing itself. The creature gains parts by touching the monolith in each level. Six colours, chosen at the beginning by the player, are mapped to six attributes. Offence, defence, psi power, intelligence, dexterity, and healing. By creating patterns with these colours on a 10x10 grid and possessing the required amount of EVP, the creature may gain a new part. It may add to its head, body, legs, or arms. Seventh Cross contains six stages, each with a boss. The stages take place in different biomes, ranging from the pond to a barren future. Yeah, I don't think this one's for me, really, I'm afraid. But by all means, judge for yourselves, as there is an English translation available.
Sonic Adventure. If you were a Sega Saturn fan like me, then you will no doubt remember the endless wait for a proper Sonic game to appear on the console. And we never got one. Sonic Extreme was hyped for years, and every month there seemed to be new screenshots in the official Sega Saturn magazine. This was going to be the big killer app for the Saturn. But it never arrived, of course. Instead, we got a few kind of Gaiden Sonic games, if you will. Racing game Sonic R, developed by British developer Traveller's Tales, compilations Sonic Jam, Sonic 3D, and one or two other bits. As the Dreamcast, or Katana, as it was referred to by the press, came closer to release, it was announced that Sonic would be there for the Dreamcast's launch. And my god, it looked amazing. To be honest, I don't really remember where I first saw Sonic Adventure, but I do remember how insane the graphics and the sensation of speed were. In its own way, it was as impressive as seeing the original Mega Drive Sonic whizzing around the screen in a world full of Amigas, Master Systems and Commodore 64s some eight years earlier. Eight years, is that all it was? It seems insane that the processing power and consumer real-time 3D graphics could advance so much in so little time. Look what's happened in the last eight years in comparison. I guess it's down to Moore's Law and diminishing returns and all that kind of stuff, I guess. Anyway, I have a lot of affection for this game. I love the graphics and I love the vibe, but my god, it is very, very buggy. As I argued in my Sonic Frontiers video, 3D Sonic is simply too fast to work properly in a complex 3D environment. The physics of the game world just can't contain the little blue blur. Nor can you tell what the fuck's going on half of the time. Sonic Adventure is flawed, certainly. Most of us were so swept away by the incredible speed and spectacle of this next-gen game that the jankiness seemed relatively insignificant. But play it again today, and yeah. That being said, look at the spectacle, look at the graphics. It's just irresistible at times. But it's still a game I love, and one that I still pick out of the cupboard fairly frequently to rattle through. Tetris 4D. This is Tetris, only ugly.
And so that about wraps her up for the Dreamcast in 1998. The Dreamcast release lineup in Japan wasn't nearly as strong as the Western release would be in September of 99. That being said, it did include some great games. In stage two of our Dream Quest, we'll move into the space year 1999 and see the Dreamcast truly begin to flex its muscle. What are your favorite Dreamcast launch title memories? Please let me know in the comments below. And please, please remember... Watch out! You're gonna crash! Ah! <laughs> <laughs>